All right, so let's talk about chapter two. Um, in my opinion, this is the most boring chapter. It has some important information in it, though, is why we're going to cover it. Okay? Talking about the OSI model. The OSI model stands for the Open Systems Interconnect Model. Basically, what it is is a uh, is a framework. No one ever implemented it. It's not being used, but it's a framework of developing toward. Okay. So we'll see. They come up with standards. Okay. Why do we have standards? Anyone know? Right. I mean, if you, everybody agrees on what they should do, and if you develop toward the standards, it should work. Did anyone ever watch those extreme engineering or model marvel shows, stuff like that? I watched the one about the uh, the tunnel between France and England, where they put a drilling machine in France, a drilling machine in England, and when they drilled, they literally met perfectly. Mine would have been like, you know, like this or something. The point is they all follow the correct standards and the, the diagrams. When you see them build things, like they were building a big hotel in Dubai, I mean, they set the specifications for the windows to who knows where and the brackets to somewhere else. And when they all, they all fit together perfect, it's like, there ain't no way. I can take a piece of wood and measure it and walk right there and it doesn't fit. So, you know, it's, but the standards are so when people develop toward them, Implement correctly, you won't have any issues. Okay? It's an agreement, specifications, tells you how to do it. Okay? And with the amount of different stuff out there, the amount of different cable manufacturers and switches and everything else, if you don't have standards, you're going to get crap. You really would. Okay? Very important. Okay? All right. So there's different organizations ANSI and IEEE. Anyone know what IEEE stands for? Say it here. Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. There's two places if you ever want to do research in the computer field. IEEE.org is great. And ACM, which stands for Something Computer Machinery. Advanced Computer Machinery. ACM is like number one. ACM and IEEE are right there. If you're ever going to do research in the computer area, that's really the only places to go okay but ANSI is another standards organization as well okay but they set basically how network cards work how all this stuff works okay it says responsibilities to be familiar with some of these standards so you yeah you know, it was kind of funny I remember when N first started coming out years ago you would see on the boxes you know 802.11 N and it would say like draft one that's like beta one okay why would you buy something that's i mean they were selling it even before the standards came out now from what i was told some of those still work which was amazing but imagine someone developing something when the standards aren't even finished or before they're finalized or something like that so it's Crazy stuff. We were just downstairs looking at the spring schedule. They're, they're, it's in the final stages of printing right now. And uh, they sent us a copy of it and said, hey, look at this schedule. Make sure your classes are all right. Well, mine are messed up. So Jim Hester, the social dean, pulled up the schedule on the computer, and they're correct. But in the printed copy, they're wrong. And he's like, that can't happen, because they print directly from the computer. So wait till we see how that comes out. So that would happen if the standards are screwed up. So the schedule might be all screwed up in the spring. So that's a... Uh, yeah. Can you just imagine if someone didn't implement their standards correctly? That's why you get cheap stuff, <laughs> junk stuff that doesn't work. Right. All right, ANSI, American National Standards Institute. It's a bunch of representatives from industry and government. They get together to develop standards for stuff, Okay. What is voluntary compliance with standards? So what does voluntary compliance mean? You don't, you don't have to do it. You can do whatever you feel like. Well, military volunteers are the stuff you have. Well, that's true. The military volunteers are a little bit different. But what happens if you come up and start developing stuff on the Ken Dewey standard, and I'm the only one, or the only one in the world that uses it? How good do you think that's going to work out? No one's going to buy it because it doesn't match with anything. Okay. Obtaining approval is rigorous testing. They really want to make sure you implement it correctly and 
so on and so forth. Did they test everything, you think? Uh, I had an old video, I don't know where it is now, of Microsoft implementing Active Directory. Anyone work on networks way back when? A little bit. Microsoft went from NT4 to Windows 2000 server, which had Active Directory. Well, I watched the video. I've seen it so many times. During the video, they says, uh, the fourth time will be a charm. So obviously they've done this a few more times before they actually get to work. But during the video, they're talking about how people give components. You know, like if you look at your computer, you know how they got the Windows logo on it? What that means is this certified to work with Windows. Well, how do you get your components to be certified to work with Windows? They just give them out like candy? No, you have to supply. They were actually in the video. They said manufacturers will have to supply the item to Microsoft with all the documentation, all the stuff they need, plus access to a full-time engineer if they got any questions. And they got to be able to answer every question, make sure it works 100% before Microsoft would certify it. So it's, it's kind of cool, so, which is good. I'm glad they do that. Then you know, hey, if it says it works with Microsoft Windows, it should work with Microsoft Windows. EIA, Electronics Industrial Alliance, another organization that helps write it's just not that critical of an organization. Uh, the Telecommunications Industry Association, we're going to talk more about them when we get into the next chapter. That's where we do the wiring. Now, when we, we'll see the different wiring schemes. Where that's covered more in the next chapter, but they come up with it. Does anyone know uh, the AB standard for wiring? Have somebody ever heard about that? You know, like the airport, the like here, we use what's called B, the B standard. Okay, that's what we all use. Everywhere. I've, that's the only kind I've ever installed anywhere. Yet the airport uses A. Like, why? Say, so with B standards, white, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, wait, white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, and brown. So they're swapped in the middle. The greens are separated. Well, in A, they're just all in order. Oranges, green, blues, brown, brown. But it's a standard. As long as you work toward a certain standard. And when you get hired to do jobs, like one of our prior students helped wire the Will Rogers Airport. They basically hired him and says, you must wire this place in uh, 568A standard. Did that mean that they had to specify to them what that standard was? No. Because we all should know what that is. You just implement toward that. Okay. But we're going to cover more of that next chapter. Okay. IEEE, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Awesome. A lot of information. They, a lot of times they want to charge for it, though. So we're looking to get some IEEE journals here at the school. Um, they're very expensive. The place where I work on my PhD is everything. And I always thought, why doesn't Rose State have everything? Well, we look to get five ACM journals and like five IEEE journals. We're talking just 10 out of the thousands available. It was like $5,000. It's so expensive. And it's always updated. It always right. changing. Now the ACM, uh, Association of Computer, Computing and Machinery, you can actually join as a student for like $25, which is awesome. You can get access to all the, the documentation because working on my PhD, do you think the internet's a good resource? Actually, it's not. Internet is a terrible resource because uh, no one's proven anything. Oh, okay. Okay, he's gonna see him tomorrow. Hold on one second. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, um, but yeah, if you want to join the ACM, it's, um, I said it's like 25 bucks for a student membership, and it's awesome. It has all this stuff, but the reason with the Internet is, who can post on the Internet? Anybody. I mean, even your textbook. Okay, who wrote your textbook? Anyone know? Written by Tamara Dean. Okay. So is Tamara Dean the utmost expert in the entire computing field? No. It's just the person who put the book together. Did anyone check it? Yeah, they actually do. They actually have reviewers check it. But the difference between a textbook or an internet publication and a review journal, so like to get in the IEEE and the ACM, you have to get your stuff reviewed, which means they take your stuff, you submit it to the IEEE, for instance, or the ACM. They take it, remove your name, send it out to six industry experts with no name on it. 
They go out, make all the recommendations and all the changes and everything, make sure it's all up to snuff, send it back to them. IEEE then sends it back to you. You make all the edits, send it back again. They do it all over again to a different set of experts this time. So hopefully by the time it's published, what do you get? Something that actually has got some clout and some stuff behind it. So that's the difference between a textbook and a reviewed journal. That's why the Internet, anybody can publish on the Internet, like Wikipedia. Do I ever use it? Heck yes, I use it. But does it mean it's worthless? No, but it's not great either. If I want to know what the name of the third episode of Walking Dead is, it's awesome for that kind of stuff. But if I'm going to, you know, look for something critical, I might get a resource from it, which actually Wikipedia is great for finding other sources. Okay, so. But IEEE is excellent. Okay. ISO, International Organization of Standard or for Standardization, basically establish an international technology standard. Now, um, I'm assuming we're all Americans in here? Most of us, hopefully. Are we like the number one technology country out there? No, Japan. No, I mean, we are way down there. Japan, Korea, China even, but even Europe. I mean, Europe, you can, I was over there, what, a year and a half, two years ago? I never lost cell signal anywhere. Come here, I can lose the signal anywhere. Is that him? Yeah, hold on, that's him. Okay. Okay, fine. My son just got back from Arizona. He's been going for four months with one contact lens. It's like, so we're getting new contacts. Okay. But um, over there, it's it's amazing the way they got their stuff set up. U.S., we don't, we're not there. We still have... Analog signals. Anyone have OnStar? Anyone has OnStar? Come on, people. It's like in GM products and basically it's the thing in your car you push a button and they call them and all that stuff. Pay what now? The funny thing was my Volt came with four years for free. Normally it's 90 days. It was, but, but the cool, they actually use analog. I'm like, analog still? Why? Anyone know why? Longer distance is going to work everywhere. And their big deal is just you want to make sure it'll work anywhere you are. Which is okay, I understand, but it's like, I don't know. That's true. I, I've used it many times. It's been very darn handy. So, all right. ITU. This is not that, what's that super expensive school? ITT. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, ITU, International Telecommunications Union, basically it's another large grouping of people who works towards our standards, okay? Global communications issues. All right, ISOC, Internet Society, okay? They're worried about internet growth, internet accessibility, they worry about some certifications as well, so another, another big company there. All right, overseas growth, and board, blah, blah, blah. All right, OITF, Internet Engineering Task Force, okay? Sets communication standards. You can submit your proposal. You can also submit a proposal to an IEEE. It's called a RFC. Someone might have heard RFC before. RFC stands for Request for Comment. Basically, you're saying, here's my idea. Give me your comments. It's kind of weird. Request for comment, but that's what it is. And if they implement it, awesome. All right, IANA and ICANA, that's the names and numbers, okay? okay the ones that handle is the addressing, which we'll get to in Chapter 4, okay? And there's regions, there's Asia Pacific, there's all over, okay? But the numbering scheme people, okay? All right? So the OSI model, okay? It says, well, the 1980s, yay, has seven layers. Physical data link network transport session presentation application. Anyone not remember? Programmers do not throw sausage pizza away. One way. Or all people seem to need data processing. I don't know. It's just the two I remember by. And it's in your book. I think they probably give you an acronym in there or something to remember by. But, again, it's never really been implemented. It's just the framework to develop towards. All right. So protocol integration is layered directly above and below. In other words, you got different layers do different things. Okay. Got the application layer, that might be your email program. Then we got the presentation layer, 
which handles the way it looks. So you know, they go up and down, okay? They have applications that interact with the software, physical protocols, act with the cabling. That will be the, the bottom layers. Look, look more of these, okay? All right, so theoretical three, yeah, that one. Theoretical representation, okay? It's basically simulating two nodes talking back and forth, okay? It's a dependent hardware and software. We're going to talk a whole bunch more about it. It goes from, you know, six to one, okay? And let's see, there's our picture of it, okay. Here's our computers. What happens is your application makes your email, whatever you're doing, sends it down across the physical medium back up, and it goes back down and back up, and it makes a virtual connection pretty much between the two, okay? Your email program thinks it's talking with another email program. Your web browser thinks it's talking with something for web browsers. It doesn't need to worry about this stuff down here. This stuff down here is this guy's business. Okay? So on and so forth. Okay. All right, application layer, the top layer. It says do not include software applications. Basically, it is how to make them work. Your applications are developed for this. Okay? It says facilitates communications between software and the lower level network services. This is no, you don't actually implement this. It's just a model they came up with. We'll see how it's been modified a little bit. Okay? All right. It interprets data sent from the network. Okay? Software application negotiates with the lower, with the application level protocols. Okay? All right. It handles formatting, procedural, security, synchronization, all kinds of stuff. HTTP, email, all that is examples of this. FTP, just tons of them. Okay? All right. Here we go. Here, this this is actually new in this version. Yay! Here's a, a picture of the application layer. Okay. All right, presentation layer. It accepts the data from the application layer and formats it, makes it cool pe so people can understand it. Okay. Makes it understandable to the different applications and different hosts. Think about it. When you bring up your webmail, so if I write email on Outlook, Windows or Office 2010 Outlook and you read it on the student email. It's not the same application. So it handles the presentation through all the different components of it. Okay? Handles different file types. You know, that's, I don't know why they added that, but, okay? All right. Here we go. We have application, then we have our presentation layer. Okay? Which decrypts and encrypts the data. Detects the formatting of it. Okay? Session layer. Coordinate coordinates communications between the two. Okay. Now I went to University of Tulsa, I had to write a chat server. Just simply, you know, basically a chat client kind of thing. And it, if, if I was the first one to bring up the server or bring up the application, it automatically turned into a server. Then the next time it came up, it automatically became a client. So I had to write that and handle the communication between the two. It's actually very simple to do. I think I wrote that in like two hours one night. It was like, that's all it was? Because this stuff is all built for us nowadays. Okay, a session is a connection between the two. Think of it like a phone call. I call you, you answer. Now we have a session going back and forth between us. We can talk, we can do whatever we want between them, okay? Okay, between a remote client and a server, it could be the web server and a web client, it could be whatever, okay? Okay, I actually, come back to that for a second. So when I go to a web page, like, yeah, yeah, for the one time, no one's on a web page. Oh, he's on a web page, he's on the email web page. Does anyone know what the timeout is for that web page? It's 10 minutes. The TCP IP timeout is 10 minutes. So if you're sending data and only half of it gets there, it'll actually wait 10 minutes for the rest of it to appear. It's kind of crazy. Because TCP IP was built way back when, when internet when networks were really slow. So it could wait a very long time. So It handles all that. Okay. All right. Establishes and keeps lines of communication, which we talked about. Keep it secure, depending on how it's being done. Okay. All right. Handles the dialogue. Okay, terminates the connections, does all that stuff. Okay. All right, here we go. We have our phone call, calling the server, we go through the internet, the other end. That could be a voice over IP phone or whatever, okay? Just a better pretty pictures this year. Isn't that nice? All right, transport layer. Okay, it gets data from the session layer, so we're still working down. We're down to the transport layer now. Handles end-to-end -end delivery or manages that and also handles flow control. What the heck is flow control? Flow control is how fast can you take it? Okay. 
You know, just a teeny bit at a time, or can you handle more? It's like, how many bags of groceries can you carry in at one, at one time? One, two, or three. So that's what flow control is, okay? All right, there's connection-oriented protocols. There's also connection-list protocol. TCP happens to be a connection-oriented one. It is called a three-way handshake. SYN, SYN, ACK, and ACK. SYN stands for synchronize. It's me calling Daniel, okay? So, you know, so my phone's ringing for Daniel. I'm synchronizing something to him. Then he acknowledges it, answers the phone, and he starts talking to Mac to me. He goes, oh, this is Daniel. Who's there? So that's that. Then I say, oh, this is Kent. And then we start talking. So that's the three-way handshake. Okay, there's a lot of exploits out there where they do a half-open connection or something. Think about it. What if I was to call you uh, or say, you, say you're all going to call me. You call me, and I answer, hello, and then you stop talking. What am I going to do? Yeah, but with TCP IP, I'm going to sit there for 10 minutes saying, hello, 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 are you still here? I'm going to do that for 10 minutes. It's like blood dialing somebody. Yeah, so what if a thousand of you do that at one time? i got a thousand phones. Hello, hello, hello. That's basically a denial service attack is what happens. So there's issues with TCP IP that makes it exploitable. I can't go and change that, by the way. All right. All right. Also has something called the checksum. This has been modified in IP version 6. But the checksum, imagine taking all the bits of the data and adding them all up and getting a specific number. That's called the checksum. When I send the packet over to Daniel, I attach that to the end. And I say, oh, Daniel, the checksum or the error number for this packet is whatever. Then if he does the same calculation, should he get the same number? He should. So a checksum is, so I get the packet, I do a calculation, get that number, send the packet and the number to Daniel. He gets the packet, does the same exact calculation, he should get the same number. If he compares the numbers, did the packet make it successfully? Yes. If not, well, send it again. Okay? So it's unique character string that allows receiving note to determine if arriving data matches what was sent. Okay? There's also connection lists. That would be um, UDP. A bunch of other ones. Okay, does not establish connection. I just start throwing at you. Okay, uh, when I was a kid, really young kid, we were loading firewood in the back of a dump truck, and I wasn't ready. My brother just started to start to throw it. Went over and laying it on my head. I still got a scar there because I never did remove the stitches. But, oh, but uh, basically, he didn't establish a connection with me. Saying, "Here comes the wood." He just started throwing it. That's what connectionless is. It just starts sending stuff. Okay? Doesn't really establish a connection. It's like YouTube. I'm assuming we've all seen YouTube or Netflix or something like that. What if we're watching this and you know there's thousands and or actually millions of packets? What if one packet's missing? Do we want to sit there and wait for it? Heck no, we want to keep going. But what if that packet arrives later and then we stick it in the middle in the wrong place? You'd be watching a movie like, what the heck? So connection list, it just keeps receiving or sending whatever end it is. Then you just display what you got. That's why sometimes you get jumpy video, stuff like that. Because you wouldn't want to, you know, be waiting on that one little packet. You can watch a movie without a packet. Okay. All right. Does not check for integrity either. It just says, give it to me. Okay. It's faster than connect. Why, so why would it be faster than connection oriented? It doesn't wait for the acknowledgement. It doesn't do that whole three-way handshake. It doesn't do nothing. See, with, the, with, with TCP, I send Daniel some packets, and he says, I got them. Send me some more. I send him some more. He's got those. With the UDP, I just keep sending them. And if he ain't getting them, sorry, dude. All right. Segmentation talks about breaking large packets into smaller pieces. So I go to the grocery store. I went there this weekend. had a big old cart of groceries. So I put them in the one humongous bag. No, I put them in smaller bags. Carried them all out, and one of mine had a bag, had eggs in it. I didn't drop them. But what if I had? What would I have to replace? All the groceries? No, only the bag that had the eggs in it. So segmentation, maybe we're going to break it up into a whole bunch of pieces. One packet doesn't make it, we can resend that one packet. Okay? Okay, increases efficiency. And the cool thing is it can actually go across different routes. Okay? All right, MTU, Maximum Transmissionable Unit, or Transmission Unit. It's normally 1,500 bytes, or 1,500K. 
Either way, whichever it is, <laughs> it's a it's decent size, but you can actually configure that in your router. If you ever go into your Linksys router, I assume some of you have Linksys, you can actually go into the setup of it, and they'll have an advanced area. We'll talk about the MTU because you can adjust it up or down. I really don't recommend going higher than 1500 because no one else is. And if you tell yours to accept 1700, well, no one's going to send anything about 1500, so why do it? But what's cool is you can actually shrink it. So you can, what would then happen, say Daniel lowers his down to 1200. So if I send him a 1500 packet, his router would receive the 1500, would hold it, would break it into two pieces. It would send him 1200 and then 300. So you can do that. You can actually segment, you know, segment it out more that way. Okay. So the largest unit there is 1500 bytes. Okay, bytes. Couldn't remember. Okay. All right. There's a discovery routine to determine how much you can take. So different routers do different amounts. Okay. Reassembly on the other end. We got to put all this stuff back together. The packets come with numbers. We want to put them back together in order, which would be a good thing. Okay. We have sequence numbers. This is identifying segments belong to the same group. Okay, specify the order of data issues. In other words, I might receive it out of order, but I can put it all back together again. Okay, that's what it is. All right, say so we have our long message. Okay, okay, oh, okay, let's say it's, right. it's the same. Yeah, this message is broken up into a whole bunch of pieces, it goes across the network. We can put it all back together again very easily. Okay, comes out the same. They can what will happen is we might hold on to it until I receive the whole thing and then display it. Okay. All right. Here's a TCP segment. Okay. We have a bunch of stuff on there. First of all, the source port. Where did it come from? The destination port. Where is it going to? Okay. The sequence number. That's a 32-bit number. I'm pretty sure it's a 30-bit number. That's it's somewhat randomly generated then increment it every time you send something. So, me and Danny want to start talking. First thing I do is I generate a random sequence number and attach it to my first packet. Then from that point on, every time he receives a packet, it's incremented by one. That way he can know what's coming from me. He knows what order they go back in. It's like labeling everything. You ever move when the movers come in, they label all your boxes? Isn't it kind of handy? Oh, this box is in the kitchen. This one's in the den. Same way. You're labeling them. Okay? The acknowledgement number, because he's going to be talking back to me and I need to know, make sure I'm getting all the acknowledgements as well. So every time he sends me acknowledgements, it's going to have a number. Okay? Then the length of it. And there's our source port, destination port. Okay? They're all listed up there. But then we have all these flags. Okay? Most of them aren't used anymore, but some of them are. Like, urgent. We don't need that so much anymore. Um, that sin and act I was telling you about. Here's where they are. So inside the packet, you can see if it's been... If it's a synchronized packet or acknowledgement packet, you can also reset or fin, which is close, basically. Finish. So, a lot of different stuff out there. We can set window sizes, which we'll talk more about later. But window sizes, basically how much data can you handle. And there's that checksum number, that error checking number. If it's packet, it should always match. Okay? All right. All right, the network layer now. <clears throat> So we did, everybody seems to need, okay. or all people seems to need, okay. All right, so protocol functions, translates the address into physical counterparts, decides how to route, which is kind of important, okay. How am I going to get there? So if I, you know, at your house, you had those long white things, you put a stamp in the corner, remember those things? Anyone still use those? I actually used a couple of them lately, but you put an address on there. Does that address guarantee it's going to get there? No, is it the Postal Service interpreting the address? Basically, this is, how are we going to get there? How to route the data from the sender to the receiver? Okay? That's right. Handles addressing as well. Okay? Which, again, we're going to talk a whole bunch more about there. Okay? Different types. We've got a network address. Could be a physical address. Could be MAC address. We're going to talk about all that stuff, too. Okay? All right. All right. Here's the network address. 10.34.99.12. Anyone know what class of an address that is? Class A. Class A. Very good. I haven't covered that yet. Don't worry. Okay. There's a physical address or a MAC address. Okay. That's the address that's 
basically built into the card when you got it. You can change that now. You can. Unix, uh, not Unix, uh, Novell is simple. But now you can do it in Windows too. Okay. Factors used to determine the routing could be priority, congestion, quality of service. That's a new thing a lot of places are starting to do. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm going to make sure that there's enough bandwidth for this to happen. That's what quality of service is all about. Maybe if our job, I don't know. It's kind of like what Rose did to the wireless. They kind of really throttled the wireless back so that the quality of the rest of the network was up there. Okay. Uh, also, cost of alternative routes. So does that mean it costs money to get something somewhere? Okay, I had a student call me Sunday from Israel, the one on the other side of the world. I love email because, you know, I said, okay, send me your file real quick. She clicks in, guess how long it took. But send my email, like, instantly. So it's wonderful about email. But So did it cost for that email to get here? Dollar value, no. But time-wise, did it? It did a little bit. Not a lot. But it did have to go through multiple routers or multiple areas to get to my house. So that's where you go with cost. Well, how many hops is it? That's what you normally see. The cost is normally in hops. In other words, you know, how many routers or how many intersections would I have to go through? How many stoplights? You ever do that? You ever try to find a road around a back back roads and like, okay, now this one had three stop signs and that one had two stop lights and then same thing. Exactly what your network's doing. Which one's shorter in hops? Okay. All right. All right. They belong to the network layer. The routers do. All right. All right, um, IP we're going to cover in Chapter 4, Internet Protocol. We're on Version 4 now. We're going to be switching to Version 6 sooner or later. It's already out. We're just not implementing it everywhere yet. Okay? Handles fragmentation, breaking up into pieces. Okay? Also handles segmentation over fragmentation for greater network efficiency, which we'll see a little more about that in a minute. Okay? Here's our IP header. The other one was our TCP header. Now this is our IP header. Here now we have our address. Our source and destination. We have our version. We're running IP version 4. Okay. All right. Don't fragment it. So, I mean, that one's uh, not so much important as it used to be. Time to live is a biggie. Okay. Time to live. What this means is this packet can go through 64 routers, and that's it. Because every time it goes to a router, it goes to a hop, it gets decremented by one. Why do they have that? Can you imagine if they didn't? And a random packet was just cruising on the internet for the rest of its life? Or ever? I mean, that would suck. <laughs> she wanted to kill itself sooner or later. It would never use uh, Traceroute? Traceroute uses that. Traceroute is a, we're actually, uh, it's in chapter four, I'm about to tell you about it now. Uh, Traceroute is a way to figure out how to get from here to Microsoft. What I do is I send it a packet to Microsoft, but I set the time to live to one. Just one. Hits the very first router, and it comes out. Says, "Up, oh, time's exceeded. You're done at this router." So it says, "Aha! Now I know the first router's name." Then I send it another packet to Microsoft again with a time of two. Now it goes through the first router to the second router. Oh, your time's exceeded. Your time to live is zero now. <coughs> Here's where you failed at this router. Bless you. So, so now we have the name of the second router. We keep doing that. I think for up to 30 hops, what trace route can work for. So there's a lot of good things with this, okay? We also have the destination. So. All right, data link layer. All right, works with the protocol. It says divide data, or divide data received into distinct frames for putting onto the physical stuff now, into the cabling, okay? A frame, which we'll show a picture of, is a structured package. It's the data plus the headers and stuff like that. The data, the center receiver's address, the error checking, the control information, in other words, the headers are added to it. Which they better show us a picture in a second. I skip one, did I? No. Okay. All right. Communication mishaps. Not all information received. Could that happen? Sure, that could happen. Or corrected by an error checking. I mean, we, we found a missing packet, so we said, hey, I didn't get packet 12. Okay. Okay, error checking methods, we could do frame sequence checking. Notice we got that sequence number. Hey, I never got packet whatever. Okay. Could do CRC, cyclic redundancy check. That's kind of like that checksum. Hey, it came through and you told me you should have had a 56, I got a 42. It doesn't match, send it again. Okay. Or possible other issues. 
flow of control, just all kinds of problems. All right. Two sublayer, sublayers, LLC and MAC, logic link control, media access control. It's not the, the MAC address you find on the network card. But, okay. The MAC, it says, it manages access to the physical media. Okay? It depends the physical address of the destination computer onto it. Because when you send a packet, yeah, you might send it to an IP address of Microsoft. But is it really going to Microsoft? So when, if I was to you know, bring up my web browser here and type to Google.com, obviously their web page would appear. Well, we'd hope it would. But did really, did I send a packet to Google? No. I sent a packet to the router down the hall. You can only talk to people you know, directly know. So I know the router down the hall. So I sent a packet to the router down the hall and said, hey, I'm looking for Google. My router's like, dude, I ain't Google. But I know someone down farther, the, the, a different net, network. So my router sent it to the next router, said, hey, I'm looking for Google. And they're like, I don't know. And so basically it keeps going until it gets where it's going. But it sends it only to the one directly connected to you, which would be the MAC address, which we're going to see more about that later too. Okay. The physical address is a fixed number associated with the actual interface card. Okay. If you want to see how to get that, I'll show you. If you go to the command prompt, let me make this bigger. Properties. All right, ever see that? I'm going to turn the lights out for a minute so you can see this. If I type IP config, stands for Internet Protocol Configuration, shows me all kinds of stuff, okay? About every connection on my computer. Okay? The one I'm interested in is this top one right here, okay? This top one. But if I do IP config slash all, I get more. And I want to show you that one right there. Okay? I did IP config space slash all. And I got this physical address up there. Y'all see that? What that physical address is, is a... Um, probably see your computer's better with that. The physical address is the address assigned to the network card itself. Okay? The first part of it is actually the manufacturer. So you could go online, look up BB or BC35B, and it'll tell you who exactly who made it. So there, there's actually a lot of parts. I was actually doing the research. Is anyone in advanced forensics this semester? No? Good. I gave them an awesome project. But, uh, I was using a UPS tracking number. You all seen the UPS tracking number. Do you know what all that stuff means? Well, they're figuring out in the project. But it's kind of cool. Everything from when it can be delivered, if a signature is required, who it came from, where it's going to, all kinds of stuff. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. So I got my students researching or doing a little project using that. But uh, same with here. This address, a portion of it is the manufacturer. A portion of it is the number. And so do you think there's ever a duplicate number out there? There probably is. Because there, there has to be. Because there's not enough numbers for the amount of network cards out there. So some, But the odds are, remember, it's only on the same network. I mean, you, could I have the same MAC address or same physical address in two different rooms? Actually, I could. Well, two different networks, we'll put it that way. Two different networks. That's like the... Right. So that's what the MAC address is. A bunch of this other stuff we'll cover. There's the IPv4 address, the IPv6 address, the link local address, and all that stuff. Talks about the lease. We're going to cover all that as well. Okay. All right. So the physical address is that number attached to the card. When I send the packet to my router, yeah, he knows what my IP address is, but he also knows my physical address. Okay. And it comes back. Like, um... I, know, I think I've already shown you a picture of my house once or five times already, probably. Now, if you look on Google, my house number is not, well, it might be now. Originally, my house number was not where my house is. It was, like, up the street a while. When my house, when my street was first built, the numbers didn't jive. I don't know if they didn't put the house in the right spot or the GPS coordinates weren't in the right spot. It was crazy. They just weren't. See, that, you all know what a GPS is, I hope. Everybody have a GPS? 
They said the best thing about GPS is you can get in, across the entire country without getting lost. The problem is that last 30 feet. Think about it. You can get all the way downtown Houston, Texas, then you're lost. So how did I get all the way from Connecticut? I drove straight from Connecticut to Oklahoma to Texas to California and back without getting lost. But it's that last few inches sometimes that get you. It's like, great, where's the darn house? Is on this side or that side? The side's wrong. Or it's up too far, down too far. So it's, but yeah, the physical address is what's on the network card. That's what the router talks to. And we're going to cover a whole bunch more about that. All right. So here's our data link layer. We have our logical link and the media access control. Okay, just two sub layers of it. Then we get to, oh, there's a physical address. This is a D-Link wireless card. There's the MAC address of it. Right there. Okay. It's a physical address. All right, now we get to the physical layer, the last layer. Okay. It sends data from the data link layer, generates it as voltage on your wire. It's not always voltage. Um, fiber optic is light, so, but you know, it generates it. Changes the voltage to the network card, okay? With copper, we use voltage. With fiber optics, we use light, okay? Never seen, anyone ever seen fiber optics before? Really super thin stuff. Yeah. Expensive, okay. Wireless uses electromagnetic waves, okay? Which we're seeing more and more of. All right. Responsible, detect and accept signals, okay? Pass on the data link layer. Set the transmission rate. How fast can we send it? Okay. Monitor errors. There's no error checking. It's handled higher up. Okay. At the physical layer, we have hubs and repeaters. It does no address checking. It just basically takes what it has and sends it on. Okay. Network cards operate both physical and data link. So I said we don't really have the seven layers anymore. Network cards are basically the bottom two already. Okay. All right. So there's the layers again. Okay. A brief overview of what they do. Okay. So when we just talked about managing signaling to and from the physical network connection okay, to the wire. Okay. All right. Between two signal or two systems. Okay. All right. We have data transformation, which could be modified. Basically, we take this packet, this data, we add stuff to it, which we'll see a picture of. We're going to add headers to it. We're going to add all kinds of stuff to it. Okay. Okay. Uh, PDU packet data unit. I can't remember the name. Okay, application layer does it because it's on another slide anyway. Can't remember all the acronyms. Sorry, getting old. Okay, then we have our segments generated by the transport layer. Okay, all right. And then we have our packets by the network layer. That's where we do the addressing. We break them into frames. Okay? The frame is smaller components, which they do have a picture of. They should. Okay. Then we app encapsulation, we're adding stuff inside of other components of it. All right, show me the picture. There it is. That's what we we're looking for. So we got our data at the top. That's our email message. Okay? We have a header for it, saying what it is. Then we take that, and then we add the presentation header, or the session header, or the transport header. We keep adding components to it. Okay? Until we get all the way down here. Now what we have is this huge packet. How much data do we have? Small amount in comparison to the amount of other stuff there. So there's a lot of... In reality, the data is actually the largest part of a packet. But the way the picture looks, the data is actually the smallest part of the packet. So what we do is we take our data, we keep adding all the different components onto it. Okay? But in the TCP IP model, which we're going to cover more about in this class, these three are actually all in one. These two are in one. Actually, these two or three. I think it's because it's, it's three layers. I think the top three, and the transport network, and then the data. Okay, so it's top three, this one, this one, and these two. I don't, we'll see in a minute. I can never remember totally. But. All right, so encapsulation, we're putting all this stuff together. So now what we send across the wire... It's all this put together. When we start talking about VPNs later, see we even do we encapsulate it more than that. All right, frames. The frame specifications. I'll tell you, next class period, 
we'll bring a wire shark loose so we can actually see this stuff and see all the different packets and different components of it. Make sure you all get to do it. So, okay. So make sure someone reminds me Thursday we're going to do wire shark. Okay. All right. So the frames compose the seven smaller components of the fields, which are all the different headers. Okay. All right. The it's a characteristic dependency, what they run on. We talked a little bit about it before. We talked about bus, star, ring, all that kind of stuff. Well, ring's obviously different because it has that token on it. So really, what type of system will it run on? Not all packets can run on everything. Ethernet is really, it's, it's, some people call this Ethernet. This is really Cat5. Ethernet is really the technology we use, okay? So it's four different frames, which we're going to see when we get there. Now, I had a student who, um, there's a lot of IEEE numbers. There's one through a whole bunch now. 802.1, anyone know what that is? Internetworking. Remember that? Because internetworking has an I. I looks like a 1. 802.3 is Ethernet. E is 3 backwards. 802.8 is fiber optic. 8 is oct in Germany. Oct is like optic. Fiber optic. See how you remember these? 802.11 looks like the antennas on a wireless router. So it's wireless. So I asked them, how can I remember all these? They came up with a really a good idea. I remembered some of them. Not all of them. Not all of them. Okay. But Ethernet is the most popular. Okay. You have token ring. I mentioned that a little bit about that. It's really good for time-sensitive stuff. Not used much anymore. Not much at all. Okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you that one. How do I remember that one? Five golden rings. Four golden rings. Three. Five rings. So that was, so they came pretty good ones. Nearly obsolete. So I think the only place you're really going to find it is in an auction somewhere. They're trying to sell it. Okay. <clears throat> they differ. They will not interact with each other. So basically you're stuck. Okay. But think about this years ago when we didn't have these really reliable communications mechanisms. This was kind of needed. We really had to have something that was time-based, was guaranteed of delivery. That's why they come up with this. Because it made it a little more secure so you couldn't have crossover. Right. Exactly. I'm one person going talk at a time. It basically... You ever, there was a game, I forget what it was called, where you couldn't talk unless you had the whatever, the rock or something. Same here, you couldn't talk unless you had the token. I need that for my kids in the car. I think we're going to implement that. We're going we're to And if you talk when it's not your turn, we take it and we throw it at you. No. We're going to implement token ring, I think. That sounds like a plan. All right. Tell them I got it from you. Okay. All right. Eight oh. Two is basically the large collection of it. The networking specifications, we already talked about some of the sub ones below that. Talks about address and connectivity, the media, transmission rate, talks about all kinds of stuff. Ethernet, talked about that one, wireless, see, got the antennas. Okay. Oh, here we go. How can I remember? I think I did 802.2 was LL2Ls, but that one's hard to remember. Token ring, wireless, got that. Eh, don't know that one. I don't know that one. <laughs> don't know that one. Okay, these are all newer than when I had to memorize this. So we're up here. <laughs> so. But there's a bunch of standards out there. Not critically know all of them. Only the ones on the test. Okay?